Thank you everyone for coming and um, we're really looking forward to our last virtual meeting of Free the Sea, this one and next year entering in person again. It's our seventh annual Free the Seed, um, <clears throat> and it's a community-based project of Land to Hand Montana, formerly Farm Hands, um, Nourish the Flathead. Um, it's rooted in building a sustainable and resilient future through real seeds, real food, and real skills. Land to Hand's mission is to build a strong community food system that fosters socially just ways of accessing food. Free the Seed provides us all with an avenue to build that system. Um, this is a free event for everyone. If you would like to support these efforts, please go to Land to Hand Mont MT, Land to Hand MT.org, and donate through the donate button. We also are providing the link in the chat. There you go. Thanks, Mara. <laughs> Um, finally, we want to thank this year's major sponsors, Box of Rain Organic Garden Center, who offers gardening supplies and classes in Kalispell. We'll link their website in the chat and Save the Farmland, a new nonprofit based in Whitefish, working to preserve farmland. And finally, all of you, our amazing seed savers who grew and saved seeds for us to package this year's seed gave away this year, in, in this year's seed giveaway, 75% of the seeds were saved by our community. We are very lucky to have Robin Kelson um, from the Good Seed Company uh, presenting today. Um, and Robin will present on building uh, community seed gardens, practical steps for successful seed saving, harvesting, and sharing. In this session, Robin will review practical considerations for planting, harvesting, saving, and sharing your seeds with the community, and helpful tips for new and expert backyard gardeners. So Robin has owned and stewarded her whitefish-based uh, heirloom, heirloom seed company, a social enterprise, and a passion project since 2012, the Good Seed Company. The community practice of selecting, saving, and sharing seeds <clears throat> is at the heart of human resiliency. Helping reestablish that practice is why the Good Seed Company exists. A food grower, biochemist, and attorney by trade, um, Robin is a lifelong student of metaphysics and the natural world. She has a deep curiosity about human vitality and exploring what constitutes resiliency. Since 2020, Robin has also stewarded the grassroots organization Arrow, Alternative Energy Resource Organization as its executive director, enhancing community food systems to build a more sustainable Montana for all of us. Without Arrow, none of us would be here at Free the Seeds right now. They are really the founder of so many of our uh, food resiliency, food system projects in Montana. So Robin, take it away. Okay, thank you. Thanks Barb. You got um, it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, welcome everyone. I'm delighted to be here at our seventh annual event. It's really quite extraordinary. Um, and I've given seed talks on seed saving throughout the history of Free the Seeds. A lot of what those sessions are recorded and on our online library. So this one today is really in support of taking us to the next level. So it's not Seed Saving 101. Uh, it's really about how do we use the knowledge of seed saving that we are all gathering and learning and uh, use it to help rebuild our food security, our food sovereignty, and our ability to be resilient in the future, really, um, fundamentally, that's the goal. Um, and I've been doing this project, my, the Good Seed Company, as you heard, for this will be this summer, July 4th, will be 10 years since I uh, 
uh, bought the company from its original founders, uh, a, a family in Eastern Washington who were growing their own food, living off the land in the Okanagan Highlands in the 80s. Um, and so I, this is sort of the culmination of what I've learned over 10 years. And uh, hopefully it's helpful to support all of us in doing this work and carrying it out into the future. So it's again, considerations for planting, harvesting, saving and sharing your seeds. And when I give these talks, have given these talks in the past, I, you know, I, I remind people that first of all, I have about five minutes more knowledge than anybody else. I don't come from a history of farming or seed saving and therefore I am the poster child for if I can do it, anybody can do it. So that's one thing. The second thing, it's not difficult or complicated. Um, you know, the first person to, to grow plants and save seeds from them did not have a PhD. It's really, really, it's something we all can do. And I honestly believe that the knowledge is carried through us in our genetics and we just have to reawaken it. It's, we really actually know how to do this. Um, so just, and I always invite everybody, jump in, dive in, lean in, get your toe in, just start anywhere. And I'm gonna give you some examples along the way of different ways you can participate, even if the thought of planting seeds or saving seeds feels daunting. There are lots of ways to participate in the process and any one of them helps re-engage you and your uh, genetic knowledge to the process. And that's so important for future generations. Okay, here we go. So um, I show this slide when I don't get an introduction, but I got such a beautiful introduction. I, there's nothing more to say here. Um, just that I, I will underscore this a couple times throughout the talk that I do fundamentally believe um, that the community practice of seed saving is critical to our future as a species on the planet. And so it's in honor of that knowledge that I chose to lean into the seed company and hope you guys will come away from this talk with a better understanding of why that is so vital. Okay, um, what's going on here? Uh, hmm. There we go. So um, I just, I get to plug these two nonprofit uh, projects because I, I have the floor. So I really wanna invite people to, uh, Engage with Aero. If you've not heard of um, Aero, uh, look them up. Uh, we're an amazing organization. I stand on the shoulders of the folks who created the organization. Uh, Barb actually has a far longer history with the organization than I do. I am just simply its latest steward. Um, but the organization was founded by people who have committed to helping to build the world we want to live in. And it focuses on the sphere of local food, sustainable agriculture and renewable energy practices because those are critical to our survival and our ability to thrive as a species on the planet and together in Montana. Um, and we do that by really helping to educate by engaging communities, building lasting partnerships and creating spaces where leaders and inspired community models flourish. Um, and that practice, that simple, um, Recipe has been incredibly effective for almost 50 years. And uh, you'll see, you can, you'll discover examples of that all over the state if you dive in. Our latest project is Abundant Montana. Uh, this is a directory that was started back in 1995 as a print directory to connect Montanans to their food. And we've expanded it to be a marketing and media hub, which we launched just at the start of this year. Um, it is, Montana's megaphone for local food, and it's dedicated to promoting Montana-made food and farming businesses and helping the businesses thrive as successful and thoughtful businesses stewarding their natural resources, their communities, food systems, and their um, local economies. So today's talk is going to be on community seed saving. We're going to talk about four topics. One of them is uh, characteristics for seed vitality, storing your seeds and the power of sharing, planning for your seed garden with fruits and roots in mind, 
harvesting the best tool for engaging community and hopefully time left over for thoughts and conversations with you guys. But before we get there, let's take a poll. So is it Maura? Somebody is going to lead us in a quick little poll, which uh, there we go. Take a second to fill this out. I, how, do, how do people fill that out? Okay, you guys know what you're doing. All right, awesome. Okay, that's so fabulous. So the first question was, what do you grow? It looks like we're getting a large percentage of people who grow food, small percentage who grow flowers and small percentage who are just starting. And 80% um, of the folks participating have saved some seed. That's awesome. 20% haven't yet. That is awesome too. All right, that's really cool. Um, I don't know if there's more to do here. It's like 19 of us. Okay, I guess I'll share the results. And then I'll stop sharing. I have no idea what I'm doing here. <laughs> I should have asked. But this is great information. All right. Um, okay, so we've got um, high education, it sounds like, on, on food growing and flower growing and just growing plants in general. That's awesome. And um, fairly high percentage of seed saving. That's great. So some of this will be a review for those of you, and some of this will be uh, new information. And hopefully for those of you who are experts, um, there's still something of value you'll take away because this hopefully will help you do even more seed saving. Oh, why, there we go. Okay, so the reason it's important to get that information is this is one of the things I can, this is my takeaway from 10 years. When I started the seed project, I just thought I'd bring these amazing seeds uh, over from this uh, family that I mentioned in East Washington and hand them out to my community and our farmers and they would grow the seeds. And, you know, I, I really did not know that it was gonna become this huge uh, uh, passion project. But what I discovered is that not many people, even our younger farmers knew how to save seed. And so then I said, okay, well, let's start there. And then I discovered actually not many people other than our farmers knew how to grow food. So for most of the Good Seed Company's history, we have been um, an education company and uh, trying to reduce the barrier to entry for folks who want to grow some food and hopefully save some seed. And my takeaway from these 10 years is the following you know, this is a generalization, but I think it's fundamentally true that if you're under the age of 75, and 75 means three generations, if a generation is 25 years, so starting about three generations ago, chances are, if you're under that age, by and large, when you were growing up, you were not taught by an elder in your community how to save seed. And if you're under the age of 50, so that's two generations, by and large, when you were growing up, you were not taught by an elder in your community in your community how to grow food. So this is pretty foundational because um, we eat food to survive. And I know that's, you know, duh, of course, you know, tell me something I don't know. But up until about three generations ago, most of us in our, somewhere in our community was connected to food growing and certainly connected to seed growing. And that has, uh, that connection has been broken. And without that direct connection, we are actually disconnected from our capacity to feed ourselves. You know, it, we've sort of given that uh, job over to corporate entities. And that's not a link to humanity. So it's something we have to actually regain. And, you know, there's lots of stories we could go down the road of the impact that's had on our health and on and on. That's not the focus of today's talk. Uh, but connection to our seeds is vital for our ability to feed ourselves because all food comes from plants and plants are grown from seed. So even if you're, it doesn't matter whether you're a vegetarian or you're, you're primarily a meat eater, for most of us, most meat eaters, the primary source of 
those the animals that we harvest for food, a lot of them are herbivores. They eat plants. Uh, so indirectly or directly, the source of our food comes from plants. And the vast majority of those are propagated by seed. And in the last 100 years, we've lost 93% of our agricultural crop plant variety. This is known as our biodiversity. Um, and so, uh, and the more biodiverse your plant supply is, the more resilient it can be, which means the more likely you'll have a variety that can survive an unexpected disruptive change, say be it a change, an unexpected change in climate or the presence of a new pest, whatever it might be. And today, over 60% of the global commercial seed supply is now proprietary and held by three global companies. So our access to seeds is actually in danger. It, it truly is, uh, either because varieties are getting lost or uh, they're be going to be held by patents or they're just going to be held by companies. So it is an act of resiliency, of I don't know, radicalism, whatever, to, to take ownership, to claim our right and access to our own seed supply. It, at the, at the it, you know, it's like our right to water, clean water and clean air. It's the exact same thing. So um, your interest in knowledge and saving seed is valuable and especially sharing it. Sharing it is vital for our great grandchildren's future. Uh, this is the piece I talked about, about reconnecting our link to our food supply. So sharing is really the most valuable thing you can do. At whatever level you understand seed saving, doesn't matter, just start sharing. So um, this, these links will also be available on the, free, on the Land to Hand Montana's Free the Seeds website. Um, these are just, there's a gazillion resources out there. These are some of the resources that I think are the easiest to um, understand if you are leaning into seed saving. And um, the top three relate to growing food and seed saving. And the bottom two relate to the developing understanding we have of the soil web and the microbial life uh, that lives within the material that we call soil. Uh, it's an extraordinary world we're really just beginning to understand and, and develop of an appreciation for and understanding that relationship of microbes and plants is critical to being able to understand and grow um, the nourishing food you seek and nourishing plants uh, produce nourishing seeds. It's not complicated. It should not be a barrier. It's just something to be aware of. Actually, the microbes do most of the heavy lifting in providing nourishing, nourishment to the plants. So the more we can actually step back and get out of the way and let nature really do what she knows how to do best and has been doing for probably close to, I don't know, 300 million years, uh, the better quality product we can all uh, enjoy. So then these are some resources online. Uh, seedsavers.org is a national nonprofit uh, that developed in the 70s around seed saving. They have some great resources uh, if you're just looking for how do I do X, how do I do Y. And then Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance uh, based in Colorado is a wonderful alliance if you want to connect with other folks stewarding seeds um, in our Rocky Mountain region. So and there's some just wonderful people there. Uh, and they can share what they're doing and it's, it's fun to listen and connect with them. And then of course, within Montana, um, I give this talk around the state. So I just wanna make sure everybody knows the amazing work that Land to Hand Montana does and the program that is Free the Seeds. So we are, by the way, the primary resource currently in the state for seed saving. It would be great to see this, uh, to add more locations to this list. So um, seed vitality, storage and the power of sharing. I get this question a lot. So here's very simple, it's super simple. It's basically just cool, dark and dry. Um, if you think about it, you know, a seed is a packet of life that's being held, you know, in a potential state and it's activated with uh, water. 
humidity and sunlight. Um, it's also heat will uh, degrade it. So basically you wanna avoid stimulating it to germinate or degrade it. And so literally any, any location that is cool, dark and dry is all you need. And again, these packets of life that are held in, in a potential state that are known as seeds. This is technology that's been developed over hundreds of millions of years. And so their vitality is like, they know how to be maintain their vitality. Uh, and they're, they've been designed to, to be storage packets. So again, if we just keep track of some very basic principles, um, it's your seeds will maintain their life uh, force energy for a, a good number of years. Uh, so if we don't have to treat them with super uh, kid gloves at all. We just need to pay attention to some basic principles. The most important thing, <laughs> if, you, if you want, is labeling. Um, at a minimum, you want the variety in the year. Sometimes it's uh, I. It's there's there's reason and value for including the Latin name of the plant, um, some flavor notes that should say flavor notes. Um, growing location or any observations that you might have paid attention to while you were growing the plant. But if you don't, none of that's critical. Uh, but literally do not, I can guarantee you don't rely on your memory to uh, be able to uh, inform you as to what the seed is a year from now, let alone a week from now. So I just label everything along the way. And, uh, and then again, I, I, I make this point about the viability of seeds, you know, three to five years at a minimum. I tell people, honestly, I mean, I've got seeds that, that will grow at five up to 10 years for sure. And then there's always the stories of the seeds that are pulled out of, you know, urns from Egyptian uh, pyramids that are hundreds of years old or thousands of years old and that are, have still been able to germinate. So we're not gonna go there, but again, see this, the packet of the storage packet that is a seed knows how to take care of itself. You can vacuum seal or freeze your seeds in order to, it, to prolong life, but um, I'm not really sure that I see the value of that honestly myself. And I'll tell you why in a minute. In the meantime, here's just some examples. Um, so cool, dark, and dry means just a cupboard in your home is fine, just away from drafts and away from heat. Um, glass is great. It's airtight and inert. It's also breakable and bulky. This is a picture of uh, seeds uh, from my freezer. Um, refrigerators can also be good, but they're humidifiers. So if you're going to put seeds in your refrigerator, uh, you want to use a desiccant. And so this this little packet, this little baggie is uh, tomato seeds from two different um, seasons. It's a variety called Principe, and this white stuff at the bottom is rice, which I, so I, I put my packets in a baggie with rice and, you know, extract the air as best I can. And that's how I store my seeds uh, for the seed company. I go through them pretty quickly, you know, that's, uh, so, and my goal is to rotate my crop, my stock as much as possible. That should be your role as well. Because seeds are meant to be shared and the best way to, the best way to maintain the vitality of the seed genetics and the seed, the, gen, the information in the seed is to share, replant and save again. Here I say it, here's what I say. Supports the genetic vibrancy and biodiversity, which is the best hedge against disruptive events. So one of the most fabulous things is that we have more and more people saving seeds and donating those seeds to the seed library. And then the seed library uh, culls all those seeds, mixes them together and then distributes them back out in different packets. And now, so everybody, let's say is growing that Principe variety of tomato, but they've been grown in different backyards and each backyard has slightly different soil, has slightly different growing conditions. And the plant remembers and learns from growing in those different conditions. And if I have now seeds from um, Gretchen, Mara and Barb's backyards that are now growing in mine, I've got more biodiversity in my Principe tomato seed variety that I'm growing. And um, I have more of an opportunity to make sure that, that my plants will survive um, 
if a new condition shows up. So seeds are meant to be shared. So here we go. Select, save, and share, and then repeat. So having done that, we're now going to talk about planting your seed garden with fruits and roots, roots in mind. So this is uh, a little, this is how I think about seed gardens. So the first question is, if you, is when are seeds ripe for harvesting? And we're going to walk our way through that. And I'm just going to talk about it in this context. Fruit seeds are fruit are seeds from, um, actually, I think I do, I describe this better next time. So hang on. First, I'm going to say that a plant's purpose is to reproduce and its life cycle is complete when it produces ripe, viable seed. And why is that important? That's important because a lot of the food that we eat, we eat it before the plant life cycle is complete. So for example, in fruit seeds, these are seeds from plants which produce a fruit that we eat. So examples include, so it's, it, I don't know, do people have an option? Can people share maybe either, either in the chat or just shout it out? Um, What's the difference between these two columns, tomatoes, melons, lemons, dry beans, and berries in one column versus cucumber, summer squash, bell pepper, sweet corn, peas, and green beans in the other? Anybody want to take a guess? OK. Well, um, the plants on the left, we eat those fruit when the fruit is ripe. And the plants on the right, we eat those fruit when the plant, when the fruit is actually unripe. And because the fruit is unripe, the seed is also unripe. And if we harvest seed from these plants at the time that we eat those fruits, we are harvesting um, immature seed that won't, won't produce, won't be viable to produce new seed. So, whoops, I don't know why this happens. There we go. So when the fruit is ripe from fruit seeds, it means that the seeds are mature. So the rule of thumb to think about is the seed is mature when the skin changes color and or the skin hardens. So um, let's think about tomato plants, right? We all eat our tomatoes when the tomato is red or you know, it's a yellow tomato, it's turned yellow. It's gone from its green stage, which is an immature stage to red. We know it's ripe. Um, we eat uh, our cayenne peppers or our paprika, paprika peppers when they're ripe. However, we eat our bell peppers and our jalapeno peppers when they're green, they're immature. If you, if, if you leave the bell peppers or the jalapeno peppers on your plant, and let that plant go to the end of its life cycle, those peppers will turn red. Um, similarly, we eat sweet corn when it, the kernel is in its milky phase, and that's because it's sweet and we like the taste of the sweet corn. Sugar, um, and it's sweet because the, the, that milk liquid is mostly sugar at that point which is not a very stable form of energy for a plant or the seed. And again, the whole point of these sugars are to provide a food that supports the seed as a storage packet for life. And uh, if we go back to this example of corn, or this would apply to peas or beans as well, um, if you leave that this, the plant and let it go to the end of its life cycle, that sugar will ultimately turn to a starch, which is, is a far more stable form, storage form of energy. So for the plant's perspective, it's trying to turn that sugar into starch because that'll feed the seed later. From an eating perspective for humans, that's just not as tasty. So um, the second rule of thumb is you want to leave the fruit on the plant as long as possible. Uh, until it, until it, if you, if at all possible, until the fruit matures on the plant. Now we live in Montana, we have a short growing season. So 
If weather or time requires you to harvest early, you want to pick the fruit and leave it in a warm, dry, airy place to finish maturing. And the third rule of thumb is you can pull whole bean pea, uh, you can pull the whole bean or pea plant and hang it upside down in a warm, dry place to mature. So this is just referring to what I spoke to before. Again, at the top, we've got ripe paprika, ripe jalapenos, unripe red peppers, unripe tomatoes. Here's a picture of a green bean at the eating phase. And then over on the right, when the skin is nice and hard, um, that is when it would be ripe for uh, viable seed. It's also a dry bean at that point, which you can use save and use in soups or grind into flour. Um, and then here's, uh, here's, some, here's just a picture of uh, zucchini. So summer squash, be it yellow crookneck or zucchini, um, is just a winter squash that we eat when it's immature. And so this over here, this that looks like I've colored it, that's the color of a zucchini when it's uh, at the end of its life cycle and the seed is ripe. It turns that yellow color. This is a laundry hamper, so you can get a felt sense of the size of those zucchini. They're, you know, at least the length of my arm. Um, so that's what you want to do. You want to let them hang out on the plant as long as possible. And I just, here's a picture of that cut zucchini. You can see this, get a sense of the size. And then in this example, I'm just, this was from a class you know, you just, uh, we just rinse the seed to get the, that stringy material off it and then spread it out on parchment or uh, something, yeah, parchment paper works best or wax paper, let it dry. And then it turns these white, nice white seeds that you've seen in seed packets before and ready to go. Um, here's cucumbers. So cucumber is uh, another thing that we eat when it's uh, immature. This is a quart sized jar. So you get a felt sense of the size of that cucumber. It's pretty much bigger than the, uh, this is a pickling cucumber. So we, you would normally pick it when it's probably the length of two thumbs. And this is clearly much bigger than that. And it's also turned yellow, right? So it's super ripe. Uh, and the skin is, is uh, pretty thick and not quite hard, but hard enough. You know, it would be tough to eat for sure. And um, so there you go. Uh, it, it happens to be that cucumbers like tomatoes have a little gel sac around them that contains uh, some enzymes in them to um, uh, inhibit seed germination. And so uh, if you just soak your seeds for a couple of days in water, they'll form a little uh, film on the surface, which is from the bacteria and mold. Uh, associated with seed that eats away at that packet. And, and so you want to get rid of that packet before you save the seed. Very simple to do, lots of instructions available online and in other courses on how to do that. Um, anyway, so that's how you produce those seeds. Um, but the fruit seed takeaway I want you to have is you want to plan to leave the fruit on the plant as long as weather permits to maximize seed maturity. That's the goal. Allow the plant to go to the end of its life cycle because its goal is to produce mature viable seed and it will do so by the end of its cycle. Um, some, some, hit, some tricks and tips um, with respect to tomatoes, uh, you wanna cage your starts is when you transplant them into the garden, a lot of the tomatoes that are heirloom are, uh, are called indeterminate and they make these big long plants uh, and you wanna try to keep the uh, branches off the ground and the fruit off the ground. So cages really work fabulously. Um, and uh, indeterminate means it produces all season long. It doesn't produce all the fruit at once. Uh, that's not true of every variety, but it's a lot of the heirloom varieties. It's closer to the original uh, traits of, of tomatoes. Um, it, again, we live in a short season. You can kind of hurry the plant along by reducing water once the fruit has set. Um, some people think it's important to prune what are called the suckers. Others disagree. Feel free to explore yourself and you can learn about suckers through you know, any of the resources that I've mentioned. 
Um, you want to harvest your tomatoes when they're ripe. Of course, I said you can bring them indoors if you need to, to further uh, ripen. Um, and I'm going to talk about our, our, the seeds that we sell through the seed company here a little bit later. Uh, but so you want to watch for frost and you want to plan to cover your plant with uh, fruit, with a sheet, you know, just a sheet from, you know, old sheets from your, from your bed or whatever. Or you can buy remake, which is a material that's used in gardening to help protect the plant in the fall from fruit, uh, from frost, excuse me. But even if a frost, if, you, if in the fall, even if a frost comes and hits your plants and you know, it will make your plant look horrible. I mean, the leaves turn, the, they turn mushy and slimy. And I mean, it will look like the plant has just been petrified or whatever. Um, I guarantee you the plant is probably still alive. And most assuredly, the seed is still viable and the fruit is still okay. I mean, I don't, it, maybe it won't taste so great, and, but the seed will be viable. Just, you can harvest, you can, you can harvest the fruit if you want, or if, the, if it's just a one-time frost event, um, don't, don't freak out. The plant is probably still gonna be okay. And the reason I say that is it's been growing for a long time. It's got uh, roots pretty deeply in the ground. The ground is not frozen. Um, if, if it's a healthy tomato plant from an heirloom variety, it's got a nice thick stem and it has a lot of resources to survive that frost. And the, the reason I say that is that the, certainly all the seed varieties, tomato seed varieties that we sell through the seed company and more than likely are seeds that you've had access to for, through Free the Seeds are cultivars that were originally developed uh, by individuals and families in uh, throughout the Russian continent over the last couple hundred years. Um, somehow, you know, over the last so I don't know, 600 years, tomato plants and seeds made it from the new world across the globe, including to the Russian continent. And everybody loves the taste of tomatoes. And so um, in, intrepid souls over generations figured out how to grow tomato plants that would do well in that short season climate. And most of the seed cultivars that do well here in Montana actually are cultivars that were created in the Balkans, in the Ukraine, in Siberia, in the uh, Altai Mountains. So anywho, you know, they're actually far more uh, stable as plants than we give them credit for, certainly at the end of their life. Uh, peas, again, helpful to reduce the water, water to the plant once the fruit has set. And the reason for that is that um, in the normal life cycle of, a, of these plants, they, the plant acknowledges that a reduction in water means, oh, okay, it's, there's less rainfall, you know, if it were in a normal situation, I need to be moving towards um, uh, all my, moving all my energy to making sure I produce quality viable seed because uh, I may not have water coming in the future. So as long as it's got lots of water, it may think, hey, you know, Times are good. I can just keep growing. Uh, the other, the other signal is, uh, or the other two signals are a, a reduction in uh, uh, length of light and uh, also uh, change in temperatures. Now here we live in a pretty high latitude, so uh, we it's a change in it's a change in water and a change in temperature that are the triggers for the plant thinking it's the end of its life rather than light at the end of its life because um, we still have fairly long days in September, but our temperatures start to change by the, uh, well, I, in September, let's just say that. Okay, um, with, reg with regard to peas, and this also holds true for beans, you wanna harvest these plants uh, and any fruit that they have on them before a frost, the seed will not survive a frost. So um, it's critical that you pull these plants. And again, these are the ones I said, you could pull the whole plant and put it in a bag. Um, and uh, the plant will continue to, to put its energy towards its seeds and help 
move that seed towards maturity out of, uh, as long as it's not exposed to freezing temperatures. So I, this is a, saying the same thing for beans. Um, I, I, I just noticed that I have a line here that says candidate for a dedicated seed bed. So where I put that is, um, I think it's, uh, the reason I say that is it's, it's helpful to set aside with clarity as you're growing for seed, to set aside with clarity for yourself and anybody else who's working with you, the plants that you don't want people touching and harvesting for food because you want this plant to be able to uh, mature for seed production. And so if I'm growing beans or peas for food, I might want to be able to water them throughout the course of their season, the length of their season. Um, but if I'm growing them for, for seed, I might want to minimize their water. And that might be easier to do, make that decision in a dedicated seed bed than trying to manipulate water um, levels to different plants within the same seed bed. Okay, so the next set is uh, green, greens and roots seeds. So these are seeds from plants that we grow for their greens or their roots. Like, so where's the flower on a carrot? You know, lots of people have actually never seen a carrot flower and go to seed. And why would they? Because we eat the carrot root. Um, and this is true for lettuce. Carrots, as I mentioned, kale, radish, beets, cauliflower, broccoli, any of the brassicas. Um, these, so these are plants that we eat before they ever flower and seed. Uh, and it's important to understand that for the following reason. If you wanna get seed from these plants, you have to actually let them flower and go to seed. Now, because we harvest them for food before that time frame, we actually, Fairly, uh, we rarely, we don't really have a felt sense of the time it takes for them to go to seed or the size that they uh, become. So same as, same as for the fruit seeds, you wanna let the seed mature on the plant as long as possible. If time or weather requires you to harvest them early, uh, once the seed has set, you can harvest the whole plant, hang it upside down in a warm, dry, airy location to complete maturation. That's a pretty simple thing. Um, second rule of thumb is you want to just pay attention to your plant seeds dispersal mechanisms. Some seeds, uh, particularly of these types of plants, tend to burst their pods. And so uh, you want to bag the seed head while the seed is still maturing um, so you can capture as much of the seed as possible. But the biggest thing you need to pay attention to is that greens and root seed plants take a long time to flower and produce seed. And they continue to grow and take up space um, as they flower. So you want to conclude, include this in your garden planning. I'm going to go back a slide if I can. There we go. So these are lettuce plants. Um, the bottom picture here is Actually, if you ever let your plant, your lettuce uh, plant uh, bolt, you know, or the weather has become really hot, really fast, and it bolted whether you wanted it to or not, uh, this is what happens. So this is lettuce that uh, it forms this long stalk. And this grows probably three feet. And then if you go up to the top picture from this three foot long stalk, um, that's where then the flower and seed heads come up from that. So this top picture, that's four feet tall. Um, and that's not what we think of when we think of a lettuce plant. So, um, and, they, and they, so not only do they take a vertical space, but if you've got a root plant, particularly if you've got radish, and you tend to think of radish as this cute little, you know, ball, I'm trying to think, you know, probably, a third of half, maybe half the size of a golf ball. Um, radishes will become the size of a good sized beet by the time it uh, you've got uh, ripe seed off it. So they're going to they just they just get bigger. That's just what they do as the, over the life cycle of that plant. And you want to think about that and keep that in mind and create space for it. And um, just like that lettuce plant, particularly. Um, 
for the brassicas or your root plant or your uh, uh, beets or radish plants, um, they can become what are called leggy. You know, they just, you've got three or four feet of uh, branches with uh, whose entire purpose is simply to produce flowers. And so they can just become kind of unwieldy. So it's nice to know that ahead of time and have some twine or rope or some means for, you know, collecting and managing that uh, un leggy plant. Um, but let it have its life, let it, let it have the space it needs. Uh, so you might need to thin plants um, in order, as they get bigger in order to um, give them the space they need to grow. You don't wanna give them too much space. It's a, it, you'll figure this out over time, but there's this sort of fine line between crowding them just enough so that they can uh, feel like they actually have limited supplies and that you keep moving towards seed maturity. Um, Anyways, so, and you want to plant early enough so that you can let that plant get to the end of its cycle. So for radish and lettuce that's been planted in April, it will produce ripe seed by late September. Um, and again, um, these, these plants are pretty robust at this point and they're, 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 they, you just want to let them get to as far to the end of their life as possible. Now, as another, just as a side note, there are a lot of the root vegetables that we eat um, and some of the brassica plants tend to produce their seed in the second year. These are called biennial plants. And I go into this in more detail in some of my other talks, but I think I touched on it a little bit in this one. It's, it's, it doesn't, it's, it's a little more involved to save seeds from them, but it's incredibly rewarding to do so and it's not complicated. Um, it just means you might need to overwinter them. And I'll, I think I talk about that in a second. Um, so basically the takeaways here are for these types of plants, the lettuces and brassicas, the uh, greens and roots plants, you definitely wanna put these someplace in a dedicated seed bed where you, it's okay for them to take forever to go to seed and to get as big as they need to get. Um, and the going to seed part is heat and resource dependent. So sometimes this is what I mentioned a little earlier, sometimes a little crowding or water reduction or covering can help um, scoot them along in their life cycle. I've had years where we've had a really cool summer and my lettuce plants just were the happiest plants on the planet and they had absolutely no desire to bolt and go to seed and I was in, it was late September and I still didn't have flowers. So that was a bust. I ate a lot of lettuce that year, but you know, it's, that's just what happens. Um, if I'd thought about it, I could have maybe done, I could have done some of these other things. This is how I learned to do these other things uh, instead. Uh, maybe create, you know, tent them or create a space where it feels hotter for them if, it, if it's getting to, you know, August and you still haven't seen the plant bolt. Uh, once the seed is set and starts to ripen, you want to bag it to capture the seed. Um, brassicas, lettuces, radishes, uh, and things of that nature, those tend to have, those have seeds in pods that tend to burst. Uh, usually, I, what I tell people is, once you start to see the green seed pods change color, by about a third of them starting to turn tan and harden, you want to bag that plant in order to um, create a space to capture seeds. So there's an example from the Seed Savers Exchange, a picture of them uh, covering their seeds uh, in order to just hopefully capture more of the seeds as it, that might break, seed pods that might break open while they're letting the plants ripen as much as possible. Um, brassicas, you may or may not know that uh, Oh, last thing is watch for frost. You want to, if, if uh, September is a tricky month in uh, Montana, sometimes August is a tricky month, but uh, you want to harvest before the frost. Uh, so get one, get a paper leaf bag. I'll show you a picture of those in a little bit and harvest the whole plant into the bag and let it finish its ripening in the bag away from the frosting uh, environment. Uh, last thing, brassicas, you want to pay attention. I don't know if you know this, but um, 
uh, collard greens, kales, broccolis, cauliflower, uh, something else I'm not thinking about. Those are all actually the same species of brassica, and so they will cross pollinate. So you might not get the, the next plant being what you think unless you isolate them. So all that means is if you're going to save broccoli seeds, then just save broccoli seeds that year. Don't try to save broccoli and cauliflower. You know, just save them in alternate years, and you'll be good to go. Uh, carrots. So here's a little story about you know th these uh, carrots also are dedicated, these are biennial plants and these are dedicated, these are also um, candidates for a dedicated seed bed. Uh, they're biennials, so you wanna uh, overwinter them. It's not complicated to do, but uh, it's, that's the easiest thing to do is you harvest them, you overwinter them in a cool environment, and then you plant that root again, it's second ear. I don't know what just happened, uh, hang on. Uh, And, um, and then let it go to seed the second year. And uh, carrots cross-pollinate with uh, wild carrots. And so it's good to, there are lots of different ways to um, ensure you don't get cross-pollination with wild carrot. And this is just a picture of a little isolation cage. Um, and, uh, there's, I have instructions on how to do it. Again, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, but we've done, we've successfully saved seed. It's, I actually really enjoy saving seed from carrots. Uh, it's incredibly satisfying and gratifying. And I'm happy to share that story at another time. So don't let, please don't let the concept of biennialism or isolation scare you. It's, uh, it's actually a fun way to really engage with your plants. Uh, herbs. So herbs, you want to really just treat them as perennials, even though they might be annuals, um, because again, they were, if we're harvesting them for seed, we want to let them go to the end of their life cycle and, and uh, they need space and time. Um, and so otherwise we treat them as we do, like saving seeds from our green plants. Um, once the seed is set, starts to ripen, use a bag to capture the seeds. Your chive seeds ripen midsummer. Most everything else ripens in the uh, fall, but chives uh, flower in um, July and that you can harvest the seed by the end of July. So, and if you wait until August or September, I don't know if anybody's paid much attention to harvest to ch chive seeds, but by that time, all the seeds has fallen out of its little uh, husk and you, they just, it's dispersed already. So you want to catch it while it's still in its little um, husk thing. Um, flowers, again, want to treat them as we do for greens or herbs. Uh, these also, well, like that. These can, these, I'm not sure I agree with the statement that I said about candidates for dedicated seedbed, but one amazing thing to do is. Uh, most flowers are incredible companion plants, not the least of which because they're pollinator attractors, but also they have, a lot of them have properties that um, help bring beneficial insects to the uh, to your vegetable plants and also keep pests away. So they, they serve so many incredible purposes. Um, I think the easiest thing to do is just interplant them between your vegetable varieties and um, but you want to start them early because a lot of them uh, take a long time to go to seed. Yeah, okay. So the takeaway is plan on significant plant size increase and time as uh, the plant ends its life cycle and matures into flower and seed. So here's just some pictures of different, uh, some pictures of different ways that seeds are dispersed. Um, and my favorite harvest tool is the uh, leaf bag on the right hand side. They are $2 a bag. Uh, as long as it doesn't get wet, you can reuse it year after year. And uh, it's a big bag, you know, that's probably, I don't know, close to four feet. And uh, that's, my, that's my measuring stick, four feet. And uh, so it can hold um, a big plant. And you just, you know, harvest your radish plant and 
turn it upside down and put it and throw it in that bag and let it finish its ripening in that process. Um, on the left, we have poppy, a poppy seed head and you'll, this little space up here, it pop, literally pops up when the poppy seed head is, the seed is ripe. So just, and I don't know, again, this is, this is green. This, this bulb thing is green when the, you can see some green ones in the background. Um, and this is a plant that tells you when the seed's ready for harvest because the, the head pops up. Um, these are all on pretty sturdy stems. So you can just harvest these when you have time. It doesn't really disperse uh, too, too much on its own. Uh, on the other hand, this is a milkweed pod and uh, you can just see that these seeds are just about to go off into the wind. So if you're trying to harvest these, you wanna capture them so that bag them in a way on the plant so that they you can get access to the seed when it's trying to leave the pod. So this leads me to my next piece. This is, uh, I believe this is a radish plant. And this is um, maybe a third of the plant's branch volume. So if I look at just this branch right here, um, there's probably, let's say there's 10 pods, there's probably more than that, but there's 10 pods on this branch and each pod has 10 seeds. So this branch alone is gonna have a hundred seeds on it, right? And so you can imagine there's probably at least 10 branches here. So um, that's a thousand. And I told you this was a third. So that's 3000 seeds on one radish plant and I'm, pretty sure that I underestimated. So let's just say that's 5,000 seeds on one radish plant. Every one of those seeds is gonna make a radish and this came from one radish. Uh, so I share this to say it actually, most plants, are, their, their job is to reproduce and propagate. And so they make a lot of seed. So we don't need to, to grow lots and lots of plants in order to get lots and lots of seeds. It doesn't really take up a, a whole lot of space um, in terms of the number of plants you need. Um, and that's really valuable to know for a couple of different reasons. Now you wanna have, you wanna have a, a number of different plants. It's, you know, I mean, it's, if you only say plant for yourself from one plant, seeds from, for yourself from one plant, that's okay. If um, but in an ideal scene, it's great if you're saving as a community member to save from an, a couple different number of plants in order to support that um, genetic biodiversity that I was referring to earlier. Um, but you still don't need a lot. However, um, so here's an example of production. So on the left-hand side, here is a type of mustard called the Gitoniao mustard. Um, it's an annual plant. Um, this is the amount of, this is three quarters of a quart of seed from four to six plants in a, from one harvest. Um, so we're talking a lot of seed, right? <laughs> Mustard seed is the size, it's a little bit bigger than the size of a pinhead. Um, here's uh, summer savory. This is a perennial herb. It produces this quantity of seed every year. This is one plant one harvest, that's a pint, a lot of seed. This is an extraordinary culinary and medicinal herb, it's an amazing plant. Um, these are red poppies, right? So what is this? This is 15 seed heads. So that's, you know, that's one little corner of a garden. It's, it's probably one plant. Oh, it is one plant. Um, and it produced a cup of seeds and everybody knows how big poppy seeds are. So that's a lot of seed, right? So um, it really does not take a whole lot. And that's a valuable piece of information because that means when you save seed, you can save them for yourself, you and your neighbors locally. You can save them for your community, share them through a seed library, through Free the Seeds, share them with your schools, prisons, and food banks. The more people, the more people and places saving seeds, the better. And you can save this globally. So just as Free the Seeds and uh, Landahan has a seed library. Um, there are thousands of communities around the world, probably tens of thousands, who are developing seed libraries where they live and saving seeds. And um, sharing seeds with other communities 
really is probably the next step for free the seeds. It's something that the good seed company has done from the beginning. We get lots of uh, requests for donations from other communities, other schools, um, everywhere. And um, we, uh, yeah. And so we try to send seeds to as many, respond to as many of the requests for donations. And it will be a lovely thing if, as we build our ability to save seeds here, we can share that wealth with others, that abundance with others. And um, uh, sharing our seeds with the folks in the Ukraine. It's a great opportunity. Sorry. Um, so I told you that the seeds that the, the tomato seeds that the good seed company sells all are cultivars that came from Russia. And here's an example. And wouldn't it be just lovely to be able to support um, that community rebuilding by sharing our seeds with them? So um, Sasha's Altaid is a, a wonderful little story of um, there's a gentleman by the name of Bill McDormand who is the founder of the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance I mentioned earlier in the talk. And uh, he lives or used to live in Idaho up near uh, Sun Valley. And it's a pretty high latitude, uh, altitude, really very short growing season, couldn't get tomatoes that grew well there. And he had an opportunity to go to the Soviet Union when it was the Soviet Union. And um, while he was there, he was asking if people had uh, seeds to share. And this gentleman named Sasha said, oh, I have some tomato seeds that I grow that do really well here. And I will, um, I'll bring them, I'll go home and get them for you. And so, and that's, Bill said, well, that's great. Thinking that Sasha was, you know, a couple blocks from his home. And uh, the town that they were in, uh, I don't remember the name of the town, um, but it was at the foot of the Altai Mountains and uh, they were getting ready to leave. Uh, their, you know, their guide was telling them it was time to leave the next morning and uh, Sasha hadn't returned and Bill asked the guide if he knew this gentleman named Sasha and you know, where his home might be because he wanted to, he would, wanted to go home with these seeds. And um, the, the guide said, oh, well, Sasha's home is uh, 18 miles from here. So he, if he left last night, he should be here within the hour. And Sasha had walked home to his uh, seasonal home where he grew his food and uh, found his tomato seeds and walked back so he could give them to Bill. And um, Bill left the Soviet Union with not only Sasha's Alte seeds, tomato seeds, but the seeds from, he, that's a, one story of, of all the different types of tomato seeds that people just came up and put in his pocket and um, asked him to take and share with his communities. And these seeds, so uh, Bill brought them home and shared them through his seed company. And you can now find all these seeds in seed catalogs uh, all over the United States and probably the world. Uh, and these are the cultivars that the Good Seed Company and Free the Seeds now offer. So I guarantee you that they will do well in the Ukraine. And um, that's an opportunity for us. So harvesting, this is the best bet for the best tool for engaging community in my opinion. Um, I've learned over my 10 years that not everybody wants to save seeds, but pretty much everybody enjoys the process of seed saving. And that's an incredible gift because there's something about the connection of people in community around seed that I think helps awaken that memory at, that I tend to talk about at that cellular genetic level um, and helps build engagement. So uh, these are just some pictures. Uh, it helps that seed harvesting methods haven't changed over the last 10,000 years. It's pretty much the same thing that we've ever done. Um, seeds that are in shells and pods, you know, you just basically jump up and down on them, you know, or dance. If, so if you think about um, original cultures and their community seed saving processes and celebrations and rituals, um, 
they're engaging to connect together for a common purpose uh, that has a particular outcome and uh, which is breaking open the seed pods uh, for the seeds, but also connecting and engaging. Um, these are just pictures from an early year where we saved seeds. We didn't get any of the cleaning done in time before the cold weather came, so we all did them indoors. This is right outside Landahan, Montana's doors. Um, but, you know, and there's a gazillion ways to do it. It's, it's very simple technology, uh, and it's, uh, it's just a great opportunity for people to connect and engage. And we have, Land to Hand has some great stories, I'm sure, from the folks who have come and helped clean their seeds. Uh, it's, it's the easiest thing to get people to come and do. Everybody wants to participate. Um, and uh, physically getting your hand on the seeds and the process of seed saving uh, and, and the process of cleaning seeds, I really think it's, I don't know if it's all the microbes in connected on the seed surface, on the plant surface and on our body surfaces, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, it helps form a connection and uh, engagement to our food and nourishment life force and life source. Um, and one of the most, it, to me, the two plants in particular seem to awaken this specifically and that's uh, uh, shucking beans and our I don't know if it's shucking, but whatever, breaking open bean pods and um, shucking the, kern the kernels off of corn. And so I actually grow a crop of corn and a crop of beans every year solely to share during uh, seed saving classes so people can have a felt sense connection to the process while we're talking about seed saving. And I look forward to our next year an opportunity to be together in person so we can actually have that physical connection during the process of uh, education. All right, we have one more poll coming your way. Um, take it away, Mara. Well, look at that. So great to see these uh, replies. Save seeds for my community is 100%. How great is that? Thank you. Um, OK. Great. I'm just going to leave you with this. Oh, maybe I can't. Let's see. So. Um, this is a quote I saw the other day, it's just to free ourselves, we need to be able to feed ourselves. So uh, that's, that's my invitation to a takeaway for you. And I think that's the end of my talk. We have about 15 minutes left. If folks want to chat, ask questions, connect, happy to do that. I'm uh, going to stop sharing my screen here, if that's OK. Awesome. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A and we can try and get to anybody's thoughts. Um, we've got one question from Sam that says, within our Flathead area, is it still valuable to start smaller seed sharing events outside of the ones Land to Hand does? Oh, always. More the merrier. Because, you know, we hold the uh, Free the Seeds event one time in one place on one day. So uh, not everybody can do that. So more places, more times, more different locations. Uh, it's the recipe for contacting and reaching out to more people for sure. Yeah. Um, I also think, you know, uh, inviting people to um, visit your garden, sharing little garden tours is a great way to see what, how other people are growing. You know, it doesn't have to look 
uh, fancy, doesn't have to look tidy. It's, it's uh, I love exploring other people's gardens and um, sharing mine. Uh, so that's another way to connect and engage uh, for sure. Um, we have one question and they're wondering how does the seed library work? Um, Gretchen, do you want to handle that or if in case it's changed in or? We can't hear you, Gretchen. <laughs> Maybe we'll go to this follow up question and then have you come back with that. Um, Sam asked as a follow up that he noticed at today's seed giveaway there were lots left. Are those accessible to offer at smaller gatherings or would it be the smaller community coming together to swap seeds? Shoot. Um, or, or, yeah, Gretchen, come out here. Come <laughs> Luckily, it's a small office. I don't know why that didn't work. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, as far as the seed library, I was going to say Robin can answer it because it hasn't really. Robin helped start the seed library, just so you all know. And um, at Imagine If in Columbia Falls, and it's similar to checking out a book. I mean, you, I think you have to be, you probably have to have a library card. Nope. Oh, you don't, oh, you don't even need a library card. Nope. Perfect. And you can go and pick out seeds and we just ask, you know, that you um, bring back saved seeds from that seed that you, you use. So we want to think about it as an exchange where we're giving you the seeds and hopefully you're going to make an effort to save some of them. So that's how the seed library works. Um, the second question, refresh me, Mara. Oh, the extra seed bundles. Oh, the extra seed bundles. Thank yes. You. Um, so right now we do have extra seed bundles. After the event, we always get lots of people that ask us for them. So we'll have them available. Um, we'll probably have them at different events that we do. Um, if somebody's having an event that they could utilize them, we're happy to share. Um, we usually get a lot of school gardens that ask us for seeds that we'll give away. And then we just had a woman, I think Robin mentioned it just briefly, you know, Ukraine is um, really losing, well, so much right now, but, and um, they have a rich culture in gardening. And so, um, and our climate is perfect for saving seeds for that area. So, and as Robin said earlier, we, we have a lot of our seeds, our heirloom seeds are from there. So our hope is to help in that project as well. So. But if you if you are in need of some for um, an activity that you're doing or you'd like to have some at your event, please contact us at hello at landhandmt.org and we would be happy to help you out. <laughs> Anything else? We just got one that says, has anyone else noticed that potatoes have come back on their own year after year perennial style? when using the Ruth stout growing method or with hay or straw. It seems the thick hay seems to have protected the potatoes through the winter. Um, I have, yeah, for sure. So that's the other thing is that, um, you know, we work really hard to, um, a lot of us work really hard to start our starts for our warm season crops like tomatoes um in indoors in march and we baby our seed seedlings and make sure they're nice and strong before we transplant them out post frost and um i have plenty of examples of tomatoes that have just i've just left on the ground and that have on their own so you know just those seeds have germinated by themselves and made it through the early spring outdoors and um are happy tomato plants I mean, that's not the preferred standard method, but I'm telling you that seed produces a resilient plant. And the same is true for potatoes. Uh, um, 
when you harvest carrots, uh, you'll discover as with dill, um, you, there's no way you're gonna get all those seeds. So lots of seeds fall on the ground and you have seeds and you have volunteers the following uh, early spring. So yeah, you know, we have a standard protocol for growing our plants. And um, again, this is 300 million year old technology and uh, a good portion of them will survive on their own and, and volunteer and make it through the winter. Um, Jason is asking this question. Um, if seeds, do you know if seed saving education is going on in local schools? The Montana Co-op is working on a school fundraiser program that markets and distributes local food. So I would say, um, yes, there is a statewide program called Farm to School uh, that is mostly about procuring food for school kitchens. And a part of that program is also um, more and more educating, uh, supporting um, schools in developing school gardens and, and seed saving. And there used to be a program um, in Montana called Food Corps that uh, which um, uh, the members of which were played, played a big role in helping schools develop school gardens. So um, seed saving is becoming part of that education and Land Hand Montana actually is doing a phenomenal role to support that uh, through their uh, kids education programs, particularly their summer programs. That might be it. Okay, well, awesome. thanks for having me and um, thanks so much for uh, joining the seed saving revolution. Awesome, thank you, Robin. That was an awesome talk. You bet. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we have a lot more sessions throughout the weekend. So make sure you register for those before they happen and get on those Zoom links. Um, I'll put our website in the chat box so you can find those links. I'll also share a Google Drive document that has a lot of the resources that Robin was talking about today. Um, um, thank you. Thank you, Mara. Just if I could interrupt for a second, I just put my email address in the chat box if anybody wants to contact me directly. And you'll notice it's my Aero Montana email address. It, that's the best way to reach me. Uh, I am on that more regularly than and any of my other addresses. So would we'll love to hear and answer any other questions folks might have uh, in the future. Thank awesome. You. Thank you. And you can also. Um, make any donations that you want on our website. Uh, one more big thank you to our sponsors for putting on all of this. And thanks for following us in our hopefully last virtual event. And we can't wait to see you next year in person. Okay. Bye everyone. Take care.